Happy, 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 blessed Sabbath. Happy, blessed Sabbath to you all, my brothers, my sisters, and my friends. It is so good for us to be back together again on this blessed Sabbath evening. Oh, I thank God for his presence. I thank God for his spirit, and I'm grateful for his grace. I'm thankful above all for Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. I pray that you've gotten to know him all of 2022. I pray that you're looking forward to know him even the more in 2023. Jesus wants to be your friend. Do you know the Savior? Do you know him as it's your privilege to know him? He died to give you life anew. He gave you a new year. The Savior wants to refresh the Savior wants to replenish. The Savior wants to restore your life. He wants to restore your heart with joy, with peace, with gratefulness, with, with all things that come in his train. God wants to bless you with the thing that makes his life and heart eternally glad. And that is joy and love. There's nothing greater than the joy of the Lord. There's nothing deeper in experience than the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's my prayer that this year we get to know Christ in a very special way, that we have an even higher experience with him than we've ever had before. So saints, we're going to be entering into the word of God. Blessed Sabbath, brother Hector, it is good to see you again. It is good to study with you. I remember last uh, week we were talking about the latter rain and you had brought that up and we're going to be talking about that in today's study as well, in tonight's study as well. And we're looking forward to studying with all of the other saints, all the other brethren. So do take a moment to share this video with your brothers, with your sisters, and with your friends, and let them know that God has a very special study with us tonight. I don't want anyone to miss what it is that God has in store for us. So with that, oh, Brother Raw, God bless you, and happy Sabbath to you and to your family as well. Happy, blessed Sabbath. You know, wherever you guys are tuning in from, do let us know. Do wish us happy Sabbath. We want to be able to shout you out. We want to let, we, we, we just want to welcome everybody. We just want to take a moment to just welcome everybody on the stream. We have special a message, a special message to get into, but there's nothing better than welcoming family and being together with family, studying God's word on a Sabbath evening, and just just enjoying fellowship with one one another as well. There's just something precious about that that we could come together as a nice little community and and study God's word, go deeper in God's word, and experience more, experience more with Jesus, brother Wendell. Happy blessed Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath to you. I'm looking for a sister MJB. I'm looking for Lavinia. I'm looking for um, all of the others, brother Giovanni, all the others. They, You know who you are. You know who you are. I know you're probably tuning in. And you're going to get in very, very shortly, but I just want to wish you all a happy blessed Sabbath. I better get right on into tonight's study because we have some ground to cover. And I just, again, want to let you know that what we're going to see tonight, we will not be able to unsee it. What we will see tonight, once you get it, you got it, and no one can take it away from you. So we're going to get right on into it. Sister Natasha, happy Sabbath. Pauline, mama, pardon me. <laughs> happy blessed Sabbath to you. We are going to get right on into it, saints. So if you can assume a reverent position with me, let us first begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath. We're grateful for all of the brothers and sisters that have tuned in to study along with us tonight as we're going to discover more and more truth in your word that would satisfy our souls with your love. As we discover more and more truth that will convict us of sin, of righteousness and judgment, the truth that will make us free, that will heal our minds, that will strengthen our characters to be those people that your word prophesies will be able to stand true to you in this last generation. Father, we come before you with the merits of Jesus, and it's according to his merits that we ask for the cleansing of our sins, of our, of our whole selves, and for the infilling of your Holy Spirit as we would study the truth 
that you have for us. Bless us, we pray. Bless all those that are tuned in and that will tune in shortly and that will watch this later. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So again, happy Blessed Sabbath to all of you that are tuned in. And um, do take again a moment to share this with your brothers, sisters, and friends. God has something special for us tonight. And also like, give a give a thumbs up to the video. And that will help with the algorithm to push the video much further. If you like and if you comment, that will um, show that there's attention and traction on what's going on over here. And YouTube or Facebook will do the work of actually spreading this further and further and further. So we're going to be interactive. I'm going to ask some questions. There are some quotes that I'm going to ask you to pull up for me so that we can study God's word together. I love when we can come together and study God's word together and be able to really come to an understanding of these truths together, as opposed to me just preaching it, but we're actually learning it together. I've already been learning so much myself and asking questions and having questions asked. Brother Julian, for example, asking questions last week. Help with our study. So let's get right on into it without any further ado. What is the objective of these studies that we have been doing? We have three objectives, saints. There are three objectives for these studies that we are doing in this series, numbering our days. There are three objectives. Three. The first objective is to reveal the character of God through his dealings with past generations. That's objective number one. It is to reveal the character of God, the methods of God, the principles of God, the kind of person that God is through the way that he's dealt with past generations. When you see his interactions with sinners, then you get a better idea of who he is. You see the Pharisees, they loved one another because, well, they're Pharisees. There's nothing impressive about that. Where you find something impressive is how one treats their enemies, how one treats those who have positioned themselves as their enemies. And that's what we see with God. Man has fallen into sin, has chosen sin, and has positioned himself as an enemy towards God. But how God responded is remarkable. After man sinned, after man betrayed God, God responded in kind, not in kind rather, but God responded in himself, in the way that he is, and that is love. The Bible says in the book of 1 John, in chapter 4 and verse 16, it says that God is love. God is love. That's his nature, his character, his law. It is love. That's the way that he functions. It ever has been and it ever will be. And so we find that the revelation of the character of God is what actually transforms people. Not knowing schedules, not knowing uh, lots of doctrines, but knowing the kind of person that God is, which is the objective of prophecy, which is the objective of every single doctrine that you find that sprouts out of the word of God. It is to teach us something about him, the kind of person that he is. So objective number one is to reveal the character of God through his dealings with past generations. The second objective, our second objective in this series is to learn to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We read that in the book of Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12. In Psalms 90 and verse 12, that's the prayer of Moses where he says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom as we're numbering our days as the wonderful number had inspired Moses to say in his prayer, as we learn to number our days, we are reflecting on our days. We are reflecting and reviewing our past and how God has worked with us in the past. And as we're reflecting our past, we learn to apply our hearts to wisdom. We see all the things that God has done for us and we apply our hearts to do better, to do the right thing where we may have made missteps, we see how God has been faithful to us. We see how God has been forgiving and kind to us. And now he has continued to bring us along the way. We learn to apply our hearts to wisdom, Christ being the wisdom of God. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. Amen. That's right, Sister Sky. God indeed is love. God indeed is love. So, that's the second objective, to learn to number our days that we may apply our hearts to Christ, apply our hearts to wisdom. Third objective, saints, our third objective is to know the time, is to know the message, and to know the work that God has for us 
in this last generation. Again, it is to know the time. We need to understand the time that we're living in so that we can appreciate the message that God has for us in this time. And as we appreciate the message that God has for us in this time to not only preach, but to experience this message will be more demonstration than noise. It will move us to do the finishing work, to do the last work that God has for this world, which is the revelation of his character of love. That's Christ's object lesson, page 415 in paragraph five. The last message of mer the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to this world is the revelation of his character of love. So if it is the last message, that means that there's no message after that. If it is the last message, then whoever is giving that last message is the last something. The last thing that they are is the last generation, the last generation that God is going to get this work done with. Saints, God has something special for us to do in this last generation. So continuing to give a little review of what we've seen so that we can get to where we are right now. We're going to be considering the prophet Joel's prophetic guide for this last generation. We're going to be considering Joel, the prophet Joel. We're going to be considering his prophetic guide for this last generation. And it is going to be an eye opener for you as it has been for me is my prayer. And if there are some things that you may not have seen or that you do see or that you have seen and I didn't mention, please type it in the chat because we are all studying together. Iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. So what I may miss, I pray that you will catch and that you will share in the chat so that we all, as brothers and sisters, can be blessed. So um, so we were learning to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So we were studying the generations. We were studying um, uh, secular generations, the way that the thinking men of this world consider a generation. We were also considering the biblical definition of generation, how God numbers a generation, which we came to understand is 40 years. I noted here that the thinkers of the world, the thinking men of the world, they believe that America will go through a great time of trouble sometime a little bit before 2025. We were considering the book that was written by them back in 1997, where they were um, based on the way that they have studied the history of the world and the patterns of the world and the rhythms thereabouts, the rise and the fall of nations, the rise and the fall of economies, wars, etc. They, they were looking at the timing of when things would um, were occurring in the past, and they were looking to apply a, a sort of a template to the future, to the future. And they were saying back in 1997 that something would happen around 2005. They said that something would happen around 2005. Now, they're never precise with, with, with their predictions, but they're decently accurate, meaning that ap approximately around that time, something would happen. And the reason why they're typically um, correct in approximation, because there's nothing new under the sun, that which has been shall be. And, and so they've been able to number their days in the way that they could while they're not using the Bible, right? Um, in the way that they could, God still gives wisdom to man to figure things out. The same way that the wise men were able to figure out where Jesus would be how G and the fact that he would be born, though they weren't part of the Jewish nation, right? Even so, with understanding last day events, God is not only working with his church, but he's even working with people on the outside. And he's expecting we in the church to have the answers for those on the outside. So the thinking man of the world, they were saying something would happen around 2005. Now, nothing necessarily happened in 2005, but something did happen in 2001, if you just count a couple of years prior. And that was the fall, and that was the World Trade Center attack. Okay, so a big event had occurred. Now, if we don't want to look at 2001, we could just look at a couple of years after 2005. We have 2008, where we have the economic collapse. So right around that time, as they had expected, because of the way that they studied history and seen the repetition over time, something happened around then. Now, these same individuals are saying that something is expected to happen around 2025, okay, around 2025. Now we're coming close to 2025, okay? We're coming close to 2025. Now, we're not saying that something will happen in 2025, but we are saying that we better be ready. While they don't know exactly what it may be, they're calling it a time of trouble. The Bible does speak about a time of trouble such as never was. The Bible does teach us, and we're going to learn in further lessons, that the to, that 2024 marks the end of something important. We're not going to see that in this study, but we are going to see it in the study after next, which we're going to be looking at the time of your visitation. 
the time of your visitation. We're going to see that in, in, in a future study, 2024. The end of what is 2024? We're going to see that in our next study. But let me move along. The thinkers use history to get insight into the future, while the Christian uses history and the more sure word of prophecy to see what is going to happen in the future. The thinkers, um, they see this generation in the way that they count generations 20 in 20 year intervals. They see this generation as the hero generation. This The generation of millennials are called the hero generation. They are the individuals who are going to face the time of crisis because historically there is a high, there is a slow fall, there is some more um, uh, 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 entropathy, I think is the word, where that means just degradation. And that, that there's a crisis. And the crisis is faced by those called heroes. And the millennial generations generation falls under the hero group. They fall under the hero group. And in this cycle, which they call the fourth turning, we studied this all before in the study, Winter is Coming. In this fourth turning, it is, um, it is all generations will meet. All generations meet in the fourth turning. The fourth turning is what the thinking men of the world call that 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 period of time where a crisis is expected to come and a new world order comes as a result. That's how it has happened in the past, and there is nothing new under the sun. Now, this is what the thinking men of the world see. Okay, this is how they see things. Now, the Bible teaches uh, 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 more, okay? There's nothing necessarily wrong with what the thinking men of the world are, are, are saying because they're just simply uh, recounting things that have happened in the past and how it may apply in the future. But God has given to you and to me some more precision, some more accuracy as to what exactly the issue is. The world will say the problem is, you know, poverty. The problem is racism. The problem is, uh, you know, inequality between men and women. The problem is, uh, 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 issues against marginalized societies, uh, 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 against sexuality. The, false, wrong. The problem is sin. The problem is setting up a structure, a, 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 a world that denies God and his principles. That is the problem. And when you have a structure that is that is being set up in that way, of course, you're going to find racism. Of course, you're going to find um, inequalities of, of all sorts, necessarily, because that is the structure that is being built, a structure that goes against the principles of God. So the Bible gives us more precision as to what exactly the issue is and where it is going to lead to. In the book of Mark chapter 13, it speaks of this generation, which shall not pass till all these things come to pass. In verse 26, it speaks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So this generation we came to understand is the generation just before the second coming of Jesus. And we also saw that there's another application to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, the cleansing of the sanctuary. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the start of the last generation. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the start of the last generation. Um, we came to understand the last generation. It comes in the time of the end. And Daniel lets us know the time of the end is begins in 1798. Time, time, and half the time is the 1260-year prophecy, which began 538 AD to 1798 AD, letting us know that 1798 AD is the beginning of the time of the end. So sometime after 1798, we're gonna find, we're gonna find the uh the final generation. The final generation is gonna come on the scene sometime after 1798. Now after seven, now during the 1260 year uh, um, uh, uh, prophecy, that was 1260 years of papal persecution. So the people that come out of papal persecution will form the the last generation. They'll form the last generation. Okay, so they will be Protestants. They'll be Protestants. So you find the Protestant Reformation emergence out of the 1260 year prophecy. And those that have come out of Babylon, those that have come out of Babylon and become the people of God, they form the last generation. They form the last generation. And we saw the choices that that last generation made. They chose to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Lavinia let us know that they invest their resources into the proclamation of the second coming of Jesus. Those are choices that that generation had made. Remember, a generation is the people that have made a choice to go in a particular direction for or against God. 
And this is the choice that that generation made to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ, to invest all their resources in the proclamation of the second coming of Jesus, to come out of Babylon, second angel's message, to persevere with patience after they, they were disappointed. They continue to persevere with patience to study and learn more of what exactly happened October 22nd, 1844. They chose to enter into the most holy place. They chose to enter into the most holy place experience with Jesus. That is that is the key. That is the key. And there are other things that they accepted. Brother Julian had brought up that they accepted the Sabbath truth along with all the commandments of God. Now, the Sabbath truth, they accepted that a little bit later. It wasn't in 1844, but more so around 1846 to 1855 is when that was more widely discussed and more fully accepted by the denomination as a whole. There were some people in 1844 who did believe in the Sabbath, but they didn't make a big thing about it. But you see, the way that a light is for the path of the just is it signs more and more unto the perfect day. As God continues to give special truths to that generation, as they continue to accept it, they continue to get closer to God and grow more and more into the perfect generation that God is looking to have. God will have a last generation that will have victory over sin. You know, there's a statement that Sister White brought up that was really interesting to me in regards to this Sabbath thing, because God is really trying to perfect this generation. He's really trying to perfect this generation. When they were considering the Sabbath, when they were considering the Sabbath, um, there was a point in time where uh, they weren't sure exactly what time Sabbath should begin. They actually thought it should just begin at 6 p.m. So when they started, you know, observing the Sabbath, they would just begin at 6 p.m. God wants to perfect the people to do things right, to do things right. So their heart was in it, and God was thankful for that. But God continues to lead them into the perfect truth. They weren't doing perfectly, right? They were just beginning at 6 p.m. and ending at 6. Why? Because in the book of Leviticus, it says, from even unto even. And the evening watch begins at 6 p.m. The evening watch begins at 6 p.m. So they're studying God's word. They see, it says from even to even, they're supposed to keep the Sabbath. So they're thinking, okay, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m., we keep the Sabbath. But God had to reveal. So number one is that they accepted the Sabbath through the study of God's word. They accepted the Sabbath. Then God needed to sharpen them even the more. Sharpen them even the more. So then this is when it actually begins at sunset. And so you had Jan Andrews who was studying it more and came to that understanding. And then Sister White had a vision. And I said, I saw this thing and I said, I have to share it with my friends. It was so interesting to me. I had to share it with you guys. This is what it says. It says, I saw that it is even so. I saw that it is even so. From even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath, said the angel. Take the word of God, read it, understand, and ye cannot err. Read carefully and ye shall there find what even is. There you're going to find what exactly is even and when it is. I asked the angel if the frown of God had been upon his people for commencing the Sabbath as they had. I was directed back to the first rise of the Sabbath and followed the people of God up to this time but did not see that the Lord was displeased or frowned upon them. I inquired why it had been thus, that at this late day, we must change the time of commencing the Sabbath. So in case you missed it, let me, let, let me kind of like review what's going on over here. She's speaking to the angel and, um, and, and the angel explains to her, look, read carefully the word of God and you're going to see what exactly even is. And so I asked, wait, so like, okay, we've been getting it wrong. Has God been angry with us? Has he had a frown over his, 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 his over his head as he was observing us keeping the Sabbath in the wrong way? Was he was he mad with us? And the angel said, "Well, the angel showed her, showed her. As a matter of fact, he showed her like how God looked when they were keeping the Sabbath in the wrong way in the beginning because they didn't know better. And then she noticed that there was no frown on God's face." There was no frown on God's face, she noticed. And then she wondered, well, why is it that it's so late in the day? Because in her mind, Jesus is coming soon. Why is it that it's now that God would, you know, bring this to our attention? Why is it so important for us to keep it, you know, at the right time? Why is it now? Right? I inquired why it had been thus that at this late day, we must change the time of commencing the Sabbath. 
You see, God wants to perfect a people. God will perfect that which is concerning you. Read that in the book of Psalms. Let's keep on reading. It continues by saying, said the angel, ye shall understand, but not yet. Not yet, said the angel. If a light come and that light is set aside or rejected, then comes condemnation and the frown of God. But before the light comes, there is no sin, for there is no light for them to reject. I saw that it was in the minds of some that the Lord had shown that the Sabbath commenced at six o'clock when I had only seen that it commenced at even. And it was inferred that even was at six. I saw that the servants of God must draw together, press together. So you see that, saints? This reveals something beautiful about God. God, and we have a message on this entitled, Does God Expect from Us Perfect Obedience or Perfect Performance? Review that study if you get a chance. It's not on the YouTube channel. Does God expect of us perfect obedience or perfect performance? And what we see through this example here, this generation, they made a choice to keep the Sabbath. They were doing it wrong in, in the beginning in terms of the timing and things like that. What God cared about was not them having a perfect performance, but them practicing perfect obedience. And he knows that if they're practicing perfect obedience, then he can perfect their performance so long as they cooperate with him. I hope you get it. You see, the way that righteousness by faith works is that God works with a heart that is surrendered. The heart must be totally and completely surrendered to God. It must be totally surrendered to the will of God, to the righteousness of God, to the ways, to the principles, to the methods of God. And when the heart is surrendered, that is obedience. Now, you may be doing it a little bit wrong. You may not be perfect in your performance of getting it done. But what God cares about is that you have a heart that is bent towards him. And that was the heart of the generation in 1844. That it was bent towards God. And then God was perfecting them, perfecting them, perfecting them, perfecting the timing of when the Sabbath should be kept. And more and more perfection was going on along the way. God is going to perfect that which concerns you. In your life right now, you may not be doing things perfectly. In your Necessarily, because there are some things that you're doing wrong and you don't even realize it. But if you have a heart that is bent towards God to obey him, to trust him, to follow him, if that is your habit, then God is going to perfect you in this last generation. God's going to get it done. So God has called this generation in a very special way. He, 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 he carved this generation out um, with the special cleaver of truth. In fact, the Bible, the, the spirit of prophecy and testimony to the church, volume 5, 455, it calls it the mighty cleaver of truth, the mighty cleaver of truth. He separated from the church, the church, this church from the churches and from the world to bring them to sacred nearness to himself. I got to move on quickly. The last generation have suffered spiritual degradation. We're going to get into that right now. Um, but this is the generation of restoration. This is the generation of restoration. It is in this generation that we will experience and that we will see that will be accomplished the cleansing, the vindication, and the restoration of the sanctuary in this generation. Remember the wonderful number we said, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The sanctuary will be cleansed in this last generation. It could have been done in the first generation of Adventism. It could have been done in the second generation of Adventism, in the third and in the fourth, but it's going to be done in this generation of restoration. And we're going to see Joel's prophetic guide that reveals that to us. You see, we already saw, we already numbered our days in our previous study, and we saw generation one, two, three, and four, and the fact that this generation of restoration technically shouldn't even be here, but God foresaw that this generation of restoration would come on the scene. He saw that this generation would come on the scene. He saw it and he had it written about in his word. You and I, this generation are in the word of God. Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. 
in Mark chapter 13 and verse 30. So we want to make application. We want to make application to ourselves in this generation. I note there that judgment falls upon the third and the fourth generation. There's something that I want to point out about that that's very important. I don't want anyone to miss this in regards to judgment falling upon the third and the fourth generation. I want us to understand, as we said last week, that the generations, right? One generation is a functional generation. It counts as 40 years in the sight of God. The people of God, the people make a choice for or against God and the 40 year increments comprise of a generation. We saw the example with the children of Israel when they chose a monarchical system. Um, and we saw with the King, King Saul, David, Solomon, they each reigned for 40 years. And so each represented a generation. And we saw that in the third and the fourth generation, the judgments of God began to fall. Now, I want to reiterate this, that this is not in regards to individual probation, the generations. This is national probation for the nation, for the group in question. Each generation is representative of a group. Now, a group, for example, the children of Israel, when they decided to have a king, that was not God's will. But we know that there were there was at least one person who said that they should not have a king. And that was Samuel. He said, no, you, you shouldn't have a king. God doesn't want that. But that generation chose that. That generation chose that. And the effects would be more fully felt in the third and fourth generation. And that's what we saw with Solomon. And then after that, the fourth generation with Roboam and Jeroboam, where the kingdom was split as a result of the bad choice of having a king. So I want us to understand that because I don't want any of us thinking that um, that it is individuals paying um, or being punished for the sins of others. No, it is not. Because the Bible lets us know in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16, Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16, and we'll go there, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, we'll quickly read this, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, uh, the Bible says, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, um, there the Bible says, oh, sorry, guys, I, I was showing the, 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 the chart a little bit wrong. I'll put it back on for you in a moment. But Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, it says, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sins. Okay. So when God says that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and the fourth generation, what that means is that they are going to experience the result. They're going to feel the consequences of the choice that the fathers, that is the ancestors, the prior generation, they're going to feel the results of the choice that they had made in the third and in the fourth generation. It is not God saying, I'm going to come along and I'm going to punish you. I'm going to kill you because of what your fathers have done. No, because here we read in Deuteronomy. Matter of fact, we also read in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel and chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. In Ezekiel chapter 18, and it's in verse 20, that the Bible says the same thing. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, the Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So that's in regards to the moral judgment and your moral judgment before God. So if your father makes a wrong choice or your ancestors make a wrong choice, that doesn't remove your ability to as an individual to choose God. But may where you are in history be the result of a choice that your ancestors have made? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is the point. So I just wanted to bifurcate. I just want to separate um, um, the, the, um, um, that understanding that visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and fourth generation, is to say that the third and fourth generation are going to feel the results of the choice that was made by prior generations. But they're not, um, as, as the Bible shows over here, they are not um, uh, receiving the moral judgment of God upon their life because of what someone else did. Okay. I hope that that is clear for you all saints. So here we are back here. We're looking at the generations of Adventism, the generation of Adventism. And 
the book of Joel has a prophetic guide for us. So let's go to Joel chapter one, and we're going to read verse one through verse four. Joel chapter one, we're going to read verse one through verse four. Joel chapter one, we're going to read verse one through verse four. Okay. Now, the book of Joel, it, it, it speaks about the day of God. It, it, it's very often that in that book, it's about five times, in fact, in the Bible, it's taught, it, it mentions the day of God about 17 times. And five times it's found in this little book, the book of Joel. This book is a prophetic guide for this last generation. So we want to follow along with this prophetic guide. Okay, it doesn't give you day and hour and specific time of when things will happen because we're numbering our days to apply our hearts to wisdom. So we're so we're looking at this as a guide. We can't determine days of when specific things are going to happen, but we have this guide. And so let's read verse one through verse four. The Bible says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Let's pause there. This is important what's going on here. So in, in Joel chapter one, it's explaining that there's something terrible that happened in the land of Judah. The land was going to be devastated devastated and degraded, destroyed. And there would be a famine and there would later also be a drought in the land. And Joel tells them, look, tell your you, your children, their children, their children's children, let them know about the remarkable plagues of, uh, of locusts that, are, that have come upon the land. Then you're going to find that they're going to be mourning upon this land. But I want to highlight something over here that it says, tell ye, which is one, your children, which is two, and let your children tell their children, which is three, and their children, which is four, another generation. Here we see four generations spoken about in verse three. These are four generations that are spoken about here in verse three. Now, I remember that we pointed out that the Bible never speaks of a fifth generation. God says into the third and the fourth generation. It never speaks of a fifth generation. So here we have four generations pointed out in verse three. Now in the Bible, there's something that often happens, especially in the book of Isaiah, where there is something called parallelism or dualism, where God will say one thing through a prophet one way, and then in the next verse or in the next chapter or whatnot, he'll say the same thing, but in a different way. And this is exactly what's going to happen in verse four. Okay. So in verse three, it speaks of four generations. And we know that because it says, Tell you, your children, your their children, and their children, another generation. So it speaks of four generations there. Now, verse four is going to name those generations. I give a name, a description. Names represent character. A description, a name for those four generations. And this is the name for those four generations. Verse four, the Bible says, That which the palm worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust, locust has left, hath the cankerworm eaten, and that which the cankerworm has left hath the caterpillar eaten. Okay, so now these four little pests that are identified here in Joel chapter 4, they each represent a generation. Note that down. These four little pests actually represent a generation. They represent a generation. And as you continue reading in Joel, um, um, uh, you're going to find from, from verse 5 to verse 7, it explains that this army of locusts is against Judah. And, then, and and Joel says, look, awake, you drunkards, and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. There's no more new wine. There's no more meat. There's no more uh, uh, food. Agriculture has been destroyed because of the locusts. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for her husband, for the husband of her youth. Cry because of this, as a result of this. And then verse 8 to about verse 12, it speaks about how they would be mourning, right? Verse 9, it says, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. 
Even their they could no longer offer sacrifices to God, a perfect worship to God. Why? Because the locusts had destroyed the agriculture, had destroyed the land. So now they can't offer sacrifices to God. They can't offer a proper worship to God because of what was done by the locusts. There are, there's a spiritual parallel to this, our generation here. So I want you to follow very carefully with what Joel is showing us over here. You have the locusts. By the way, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, the, the palm worm, those are all different type of locusts. If you read in different Bible versions, they're, they're called like a small locust, a young locust, etc. Those are all different type of locusts that have done a terrible work of destruction. They were eating up each, each later um, a, a locust's opportunity to a full meal. They were gnawing away at it. They were just eating up selfishly each lo other locust's opportunity to a full meal. I also want you to note that they're all in the same family. These four, four little pests, they're all in the same family. Does that happen in your family? Selfishness, bickering, infighting, destruction. How is it in your homes? God says that if it is like that, then you ought to be crying. You ought to be sighing and crying. That's what that's the spiritual application that we're finding over here in the book of Joel, chapter one. And then when you get to verse 13, when you get to verse 13, what does it say? In verse 13, it says, Gird yourselves and lament ye priests. How will ye ministers of the altar come lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of God? For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your Lord. He's saying, You guys need to cry. Because now you can't even give a meat offering to God. You can't even give a, a sacrifice to God. You need to be crying because of the destruction of the locust uh, uh, means that you can no longer offer the meat offering to God. Verse 15, uh, no, verse 14. I can't jump from verse 14. It says, sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as the destruction from the Almighty shall it come. As a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. So there, and as you continue reading, you see that there's a terrible drought. No more water, no more water, no more rain falling upon the land after all the destruction, agricultural destruction has been done. So that's what we see in Joel chapter 1. Which is why, as a result of the destruction by the locusts, because of the destruction of the locusts. Now, when we go to the book of Joel, chapter two, now, when we go to Joel, chapter two, Joel, chapter two, it speaks, it continues to speak about the day of the Lord. And it speaks of this mighty army that invades Judah. And what that army looks like, they, 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 they are devouring, right? It says, a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burneth, right? But verse, verse one, it says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. This is the time of judgment that's being spoken about here. Destruction had happened in, in chapter one and here it's talking about the time of judgment and alarm and an alarm needs to be given to the world. An alarm needs to be given to all of those in Judah as a result of all this. And they need to understand judgment is coming upon them because they had rejected God, because they had gone against God. Judgment is going to be coming upon them. Judgment is coming upon them by this mighty army. And it speaks of what this mighty army is going to do around verse six. Before their face, the people shall be much pain. All faces shall be shall gather black blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the walls like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. So that's speaking about the army and, and, and what that, that army is going to do to the people of God. Neither shall one trust another. They shall walk everyone in his path, and they shall fall upon the sword. They shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the walls and shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter in his, his voice before the army 
for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? This is speaking about the judgment of God. This again is speaking about the judgment of God. And now in verse 12, now in verse 12 to about verse 17, verse 12 to verse 17, the people are called to repentance. The people are called to repentance. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Turn to me, God is saying. Turn to me. Are these judgments going to fall? Yes, but God's loving heart is still calling for his children to turn to him. You see, those judgments, it's not that God wants to bring destruction. In fact, the, just, the, the destruction that's coming upon his people is the result of their choice. It is not God, but it is their choice that has caused for this as a result, the judgments to fall upon them their bad choice against God. And, but then what does God do? He calls them, repent, turn from your wicked ways and come to me. I will save you. Verse 13, and rend your hearts and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of evil. Look at that, speaking about the goodness, the character of God, his methods, the kind of person that he is. He wants to save and preserve his people. Verse 14, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord. Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Now, this is day of atonement language here. This is day of atonement sanctuary language. So you know that this application for us, I'm just looking at the primary application of them in the time of Israel and Judah, we want to make spiritual application to us very shortly. But it says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the, 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 the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? God, don't let your people embarrass you, that your name be praised. In fact, they're saying the same thing that Moses said. Don't let your people be destroyed. How's that going to make you look before all the other nations? The ministers were to do what Moses did, which was to weep and pray to God and offer sacrifices to God and to fast that God would spare his children, preserve his children so that his name may be praised throughout the world. That's what they were called to do. Now, I want to jump down a bit closer. I want to jump down a bit closer to verse 23. Verse 23, it says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. You see, because in chapter one, it spoke about the, the locust, the its destruction, and how there was a drought. No rain. There was a drought. But now God is saying to the children of John, rejoice. I gave you the former rain. I'm going to give you the former rain, and I'm going to give you the latter rain. You have lost things prior, but you turn to me. I'm going to, well, let's see what he says in verse 24. And the floors and the vats shall be full of wheat, and the, uh, and the floors shall... And the floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And what is God going to do? He says, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palm worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. So that's a review of what's going on, not of the whole chapter, but of chapter one and of chapter two of the book of Joel. Now, this again is a prophetic guide for you and for me living in this last generation. And this is the heart of the matter. I don't want you to miss this 
at all. I do not want you to miss at all what was just going on over here. Those four generations in Joel chapter one, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, those represent four generations. And as we read in Joel chapter one, the locusts, these little pests, they destroyed the land. They destroyed the land where the people couldn't offer a perfect sacrifice to God. They were destroying the land. Now, these represent four generations. And these also represent the four generations in Adventism, the generations of degradation. You see, the generations of degradation brought much destruction to our church, sadly. You see, God began to do a mighty work. You know that God wanted to return in the first generation. God wanted to come back to this world in the first generation. You see, this is the last generation. The first 40 years of Adventism was the last generation at that time. And Christ could have returned in that generation. Remember, the last generation comes sometime after 1798. And we came to understand October 22nd, 1844 was the beginning of the last generation. Christ determined for that generation to be the last generation. He determined for that generation to be the last one. I'm going to prove it to you. In the spirit of prophecy, it says this. This, is, this was written in 1883. Now, the first generation was October 22nd, 1844. So from 1844 to 1884. Now I'm going to show you something that Sister White wrote in 1883 in reference to what was going on back in 1844. We're going to, we're going to heat up a little more, a little bit more right now. She said, had Adventist after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the, let me put it like this right here. No, uh, no, here we go. Had Adventist after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast to their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed and Christ would have come. Er this to receive his people to their reward. She said, Christ would have returned in the first generation if they had taken the, the proclamation of the third angel's message. As it was their privilege to take it on, Christ would have returned in that generation. He would have returned in that generation, but sadly, 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 he did not return. Now that's in early writings, page 299, paragraph four. And in fact, I should read it from the book Evangelism, page 695. Evangelism 695. I'm, I'm going to pull it up here on my iPad. Evangelism page 695, paragraph one. It's said in an amazing way there. EV 695, 695, um, paragraph one. It says the same thing, but there's a little bit more that is said there. 695. Um, hmm. God. Mm, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let me, make, let me, there we go. It's not paragraph one. It's actually paragraph three. Pardon me. It's paragraph three. But this is what it says. Had Adventists after the great disappointment, we just read that, um, uh, accepted the message, then Christ could have come or this to receive his people. Now look at what's highlighted in yellow. It says, but in the period, but in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Adventist believers yielded their faith. They gave up their faith. Thus, the work was hindered and the work was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history? How widely different would have been our history if, as the last generation, if they would have taken up the third angel's message as it was their privilege to take it up? You see, again, Jesus wanted to come in that first generation. He wanted to return in that first generation, but sadly, Laodicean lukewarmness took over the people. Laodicean lukewarmness took over the people in the first generation. But God knew that that would happen, and so he was preparing some people to do a special work in the second generation. When you look in the second generation, we know that 1888, in, in the second generation, 
there was a special message that came in 1888 to heal the church of Laodicean lukewarmness. We're going to get into that in future studies, the details of it, the condition of the generations, as well as the special truths that God had for each generation. But God had a special healing message that he gave in, in, in 1888 through elders Wagner and Jones. But sadly, it was rejected by the people. It was rejected. In fact, we're told that Satan succeeded. If somebody could actually find that quote and share that with us in the chat, it actually says, it's, I believe it's first select the messages page. Is it 200? Is it first select the message? I believe it's 234 paragraph one, where it says that Satan succeeded. Satan succeeded to, in shutting away from the people in a large measure, the outpouring of God's spirit, Satan succeeded. If somebody could put that in the chat, we'll be so grateful for that that that, 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 that she points that out. God had something special for that second generation, but they rejected that message in 1888. And in the second generation, in 19, we know that in 1863, right, the church was officially organized, was officially organized in 1863. And there are testimonies. We don't have it. Here tonight, but in future studies, we're going to see it. There are testimonies where Sister White clearly said, she, you know what she said? She says, and you could, you could even find this quote if you'd like. She says that it is not wise to choose one man to be president of the general conference. She said it is not wise to choose one man to be president of the general conference. Now, we're not speaking against the church. We're not speaking against the conference. None of that stuff. What are we doing? We're considering the conditions of the generations, each generation. We're told that special truths have been given for the conditions of the generations. We read that statement many times. So when we're considering the, when, when I'm making a statement like that about what's going on in the church, what has gone on in the church, how, 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 what the spirit of prophecy says concerning the way that we were organized, what God really wanted, the broken blueprint, etc. It is not to air out our dirty laundry. Okay. We have better things to do. But it's to understand the condition of our generation and the special truths that God had for those past generations. So that when we consider the condition of this generation, which shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled, then we can more thoroughly appreciate the special truths that God has for this generation. That's why we're numbering our days. That's why we're reflecting upon our days so that we could apply our hearts to wisdom. So that we could apply our hearts to wisdom. So sadly, in the second generation, Satan succeeded. Satan succeeded of stopping the latter rain from falling upon we God's people. Satan succeeded in that. Sister White said that. And then in 1903, there was a special general conference that occurred. In 1903, there was a very special general conference that occurred. And Sister White in that general conference, let me see something over here. Do I have, do I have, no, I don't have the statement. Sister White in that general conference, Sister White in that general conference, she said, brethren and sisters, from the light given to me, I know that if the people of God had preserved a living connection with him, if they had obeyed his word, they would today be in the heavenly Canaan. That was in 1903 that she said that. 1903, that's in the second generation. So that means that God could have came in the second generation. Again, I'll reread the statement. I should have had it on the screen, but I don't. It says, brethren and sisters, from the light given me, I know that if the people of God had preserved a living connection with him, if they had obeyed his word, they would today be in the heavenly Canaan. She said that March 30th, 1903. That's in the General Conference Daily Bulletin. She said that. She said that. So God could have came in the first generation. He could have came in the second generation. We're going to see a lot more quotes in the future to like really nail this thing down. I want to put this nail in a sure place. But now we should expect for judgment to fall on the third and the fourth generation. We should expect for judgment to fall on the, oh, thank you, Brother Christian. Thank you, Brother Christian. Yes, thank you. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeding and succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure, the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. First like message, page 234 and paragraph six. Thank you so much for putting that. That special power of the Holy Spirit that's spoken about is the latter rain. 
God wanted to pour out the latter rain and Satan succeeded in stopping that from happening in the second generation. You know that God wants to pour out his latter rain on this last generation? We're going to see that in this study before we close. I'm not going to miss sharing that. We're going to see that. But back here in the, in the third generation, that's where we find the development of the church manual. In the, church, in the third generation, that's where we can we hear more claims of accepting the 1888 message while it was not accepted and clearly, Sister White clearly said that it was rejected. In the third generation, we, we, we suffer our evangelical earthquake. You have Walter Martin that, that was writing a book called Kingdom of, the, Kingdom of the Cults. You have Adventists that couldn't properly converse with him. In fact, there's a video on, uh, I, I think it's still on YouTube. I watched it several years ago, so I don't know if it's still up, where uh, I think it was the Sabbath school leader uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the church at large. He was in a debate with, um, with, with Walter Martin. I think it was on John, John, I forget his last name, but it's, it's a it was a religious show or whatnot. And it, it was a pretty embarrassing debate, if I, if I should just say so plainly. And, 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 and how Walter Martin was just attacking our faith, attacking, attacking, attacking. And we just weren't properly, at least the representatives, weren't properly standing for what we believe. I'm like, man, what's going on over here? Our evangelical earthquake, it caused a big issue in our church. The denial of the nature of Jesus Christ, attacks against the sanctuary, and all these things in the, in the 1950s and 60s. That was in the 1950s and 60s that that was going on in the third generation. And um, eight, there's a book called 1888 Reexamined. We're going to see all that in the future. 1888 Reexamined. Um, that was bringing us back to the 1888 message. But again, it was being rejected. Again, it was being rejected in the 1960s. Now, you'll be interested to know that in 1888, when, the, when that message was, was being brought forth, did you know that Sunday laws were being um, were being were, were being pushed. Sunday laws were being pushed. The same thing was going on in the 1960s. Sunday laws began to be talked about a bit more. Why? Because this, that when this message of justification by faith in the righteousness of Christ becomes more prominent, he knows that the end is near. He knows that the end of near is near. So when we study the prior generations we, and we see things like that, I think we should get an idea of what we need to be doing in this final generation of Earth's history. In the fourth generation, there's a ton that happened, but we don't have time to get into it because I need to get to a certain place. There was a Glacier View conference with, with, with Desmond Ford denying the sanctuary and who has taught many other pastors to do the same, but they have remained in the church. And many issues have happened in our church. Each of those four little pests, degradation, so that we can't give to God because we don't know any better, the perfect and pure worship and sacrifice that he's looking for. Why? Because our religion has been changed. Books of a new order have been written. You know the statement in the spirit of prophecy. I don't remember exactly where it is, but if somebody could put it in the chat, if you remember where it is, where it says that our religion will be changed, books of a new order will be written, and all these different spiritualistic things will be coming into the church. Sister White prophesied it. Sister White prophesied it. And that's what's been going on in the generations of degradation. So like the children of Israel, like those in Judah back then, the locusts, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, the palm word has done its work, have done their work of degradation, have done their work of degradation. They've done their work of degradation, but God restores. God restores. So in Joel chapter two, we read verse 23 to verse 27. We would go back to Joel chapter two, Joel chapter two from verse 23. And we're going to make application to us saints. We're going to make application to us in Joel chapter two. What do we see there in verse 23? It says, be glad then ye children of Zion. Who is supposed to be glad? The children of Zion. Now, remember, Zion is a special place. Who is on Mount Zion in Revelation and chapter 14? Who is on Mount Zion? The 140 and 4,000. So this message over here is for the last generation. This message is for the 140 and 4,000. Who else is on Zion? Jesus. 
So they are in the presence of Jesus. So this says, be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down upon you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. You see, the previous generation had opportunity to have the latter rain, but they rejected it. But God says over here, you children of Zion, I'm going to give you the former rain and the latter rain. You are going to receive the latter rain and the floor shall be full of wheat. So you're going to, so, so, so before it, the wheat was eaten up by the prior generations, the generation of degradation, eating up each successive generation's opportunity to a full meal, to the full experience of the word of God. Because the religion was changed, it was diluted. God says, "You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get the wheat. You're, I am gonna have a whole wheat church. You ever heard that before? I am gonna have a whole wheat church. God's gonna feed His last generation, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you, to who? To you. Who is the you that will be restored? This generation, the generation of restoration. But I want us to be more specific. Who is the you that will be restored according to verse 23? According to verse 23, who is the you that is going to be restored? According to verse 23, the you that is going to be restored is the children of Zion. The you that is going to be restored is the children of Zion. Let me pause right now. Let's see. I see a couple of comments come in and I, and I want to be able to consider the comments that are coming in because, ooh, th th this is this is important. Okay, so let's do it like this. All right, what do we have here? Um, Sister Carissa, it is not wise to choose one man as president of the general conference. The work of the general conference has extended and some things have been made unnecessarily complicated. Continued, um, a want of discernment has been shown. There should be a division of the field or some other plan should be devised to change the present order of things. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. Uh, more perfectly, um, that's on page 342. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sister Tamara brings out the fundamental principle that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organ organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. That's First Selected mes Messages, page 204 and paragraph two. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you again for Brother Christian for sharing that quote a little bit earlier. So, so, so saints, I think that this is clear for us. I think that this is clear for us. The generation of degradation and where it has brought us to, it has brought us to and God to the opportune time of restoring this generation. And as we have just read, as we have just read in Joel chapter two, we have read that God will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palm worm, my great army, which I sent among you. I don't want you to get this twisted. In our previous studies, as we've studied, um, um, uh, we have a series of studies on religious liberty. And in that series of studies, you know, that which is unto Caesar, give to Caesar, that which is unto God, give unto God. We did that, um, I think it was back in 2020. I recommend that you review those studies. Very important. Um, we point out the fact that God calls uh, Nebuchadnezzar his servant, right? But we know that Nebuchadnezzar wasn't God's servant, right? He wasn't. God didn't appoint, God didn't anoint him. Or anything, but he called him his servant. Um, it was God's way of explaining. It's the biblical writers, their way of explaining uh, that that God, in allowing man to decide how they would govern themselves, right? That is His allowance, and in allowing God to in, in allowing man to decide how they would govern themselves, they chose to have a king. So now, when the king does things in a certain way, right? It is God's permissive will, not His perfect will. It is God's permissive will. So that is why Nebuchadnezzar is called God's servant. He's not God's servant because he actually serves God. He, he doesn't. You, you, we, we remember what he said about God. Okay, you remember how he showed his care for God? He didn't. Okay, but God called him his servant because he was serving a particular work. He was doing, he was fulfilling a purpose. When the children of Israel had rejected God, 
right? Judgment was going to fall upon them. Nebuchadnezzar could have could have captured them a very long time ago. He could have destroyed them a very long time ago. But why didn't he? Because he couldn't. Why couldn't he? Because God's protective hedge was around the children of Israel. But once they had rejected God, the protective hedge is no is removed and no longer there. So now judgment falls upon them in measure, in measure. So God allows for Nebuchadnezzar to do his work of judgment. He, he allows Nebuchadnezzar to come in and to take over the children of Israel. He allowed it. That's why God calls him his servant, not because he actually serves him, but because the children of Israel and going against God, God can no longer protect them as he normally did. So he can't stop the surrounding nations from attacking. So then it is so so that the, the activities that happened to Israel, it was always said that God was doing it. So they phrase it God's servant. You know, God is the one that's doing this when really God is the one that is allowing this. So that army, it's not his army in the sense that he inspired them to do this work of, of degradation, of destruction, but it's what God had allowed because of our exercising our free choice, our free will to go against him, to make wrong decisions that cause for the latter rain to not be able to fall, that cause for the loud cry to not go forth, certain decisions that was made by his people. But God says he will restore to us everything that we lost from the previous generations. He's going to restore to us everything that we lost from the previous generations. So it's as though God has different names for the generation of restoration. He has different names for the generation of restoration. We have that in the notes right over here. What were some of those names? Some of the names were what? Um, well, children of Zion, the children of Zion in verse 23. We know that the children of Zion, they're those who receive the latter rain. We know that those who receive the latter rain, they give the loud cry. And we know that that is the 140 and 4,000 because they are on Mount Zion with Jesus Christ. They're on Mount Zion with Jesus Christ. So saints, this message is for you and me who would form the 140 and 4,000. There's also another name for this generation of restoration, the 144,000, the children of Zion. But I want you to see their other name. It's found in verse 32. You know what? We'll just read up to verse 32. You know, these people in verse 27, the Bible says, and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. This will happen in this last generation and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids and in those days i will pour out my spirit in this generation this will happen and i will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and the pillar of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into the into blood before the great and terrible day of the lord come verse 32 is where we're going to find the other name for this generation of restoration it is what and it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion, you find uh, the 144,000, the children of God, the children of Zion. And for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. You see, there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And God's children are going to be delivered. Who are God's children? Who are those people? The remnant. Who God has called. God has called this generation. In Isaiah chapter 41, we read that. God called this generation from the beginning. God called this generation from the beginning. This generation of restoration. This generation, the children of Zion. This generation that is on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, the city of peace, with Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has been slain for you and for me, the remnant. This is us that God is speaking about. This is this generation that God is speaking about. This generation will accomplish the completion of the cleansing, the vindication, and the restoration of God's sanctuary. They will receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The latter rain will be poured out upon them in a large measure. God determined for that to be our experience. This is the time that we're living in. So what should you and I be doing in this time? What should you and I be doing in this time? Let's make it a little bit practical. Well, because we understand the time, the time that we're living in is the time of the latter rain. The time that we're living in right now is the time of the latter rain, is the time of the latter rain. 
and we are told we must not wait for the latter rain. It is coming upon all who will recognize and appropriate the dew and showers of grace that fall upon us. When we gather up the fragments of light, when we appreciate the sure mercies of God who loves to have us trust him, then every promise will be fulfilled. Every promise of God will be fulfilled. The whole earth will be filled with the glory of God. So what should you and I be doing? We've suffered as a result of the generations of degradation, but here we are now in the generation of restoration. What should we be doing in this generation? Well, Jesus let us know in Mark chapter 13 that this generation shall not pass. But as we continue to read after verse 30, he says that we need to watch and pray. We need to watch and pray. We are the generation of restoration. We need to watch for the time of our visitation. We're going to study that, not in the next study, but in the study after that, the time of our visitation. But we need to watch and pray. What should we be praying for? We should be praying for restoration because it's in this generation that that is expected. We should be praying for the latter rain. This generation should be praying for the latter rain and God will hear it because God knows that there's been a drought. God knows that, that there's been a famine because of the, because of the degradation that has occurred from the prior four generations. God knows, and he told us in Joel chapter two that he's gonna restore to us everything that we lost. He will bring back the rain. He's gonna give it all back unto us so that we can accomplish the cleanse, so that the, the sanctuary can be cleansed, so that the sanctuary can be restored. I'm gonna prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. Go to the book of Psalms. Go to the book of Psalms chapter 102. We're going to read Psalm chapter 102 to close. We're going to read Psalm chapter 102, verse 16 to verse 21 to close. Psalm chapter 102. There we find our answer of what exactly this generation needs to do. Psalm chapter 102, verse 16 to verse 21. Psalms 102, reading from verse 16. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, when he shall do what? When he builds up Zion. Who's Zion? You and me. Creating. He's creating Zion, creating in you and me a clean heart. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Ah, so the process of God's glory enlightening the earth is the process of God building up Zion, you and me. Verse 17 he will regard the prayer of the destitute. Those who have suffered from the prior degradation, those who have suffered from famine, Joel chapter one and chapter two, those who have suffered from the drought, he will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. Verse 18, this shall be written for the generation to come. My God, this was written for this generation that God saw would come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. God is going to perfect a people. He's going to perfect that which concerneth you. God's going to create this last generation that's going to look just like Jesus. Verse 19, for he has looked down from the height of his sanctuary. It doesn't say his mountain. It says his sanctuary. So God is looking for, from his sanctuary. Why? The Bible is so inspired. It's saying that he's looking for his from his sanctuary because there's a work in his sanctuary that he's doing that's related with his people. What is that work that he's doing in his sanctuary that's related to his people? It is the cleansing of the sanctuary. It is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Saints, we are going to review this again because even for me, this is bright light. And, and as I'm seeing this stuff, I'm like, Lord, help me to properly articulate this to your people. Help me to, in a better way, please share this in such a way that they can perfectly understand and see this thing. I pray that you see this thing, that this is speaking about the 144,000, this last generation, the generation of restoration who has suffered destitution because of the prior generations of degradation, but who will experience restoration because of God performing the completion of the cleansing of the sanctuary. That's what's going on over here. Let me read it again from verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, that is his people, he shall appear in his glory, that is his character. It will be upon you and upon me. 
he will regard the prayer of the destitute, those who are praying because they have lost everything, those who are praying for the latter rain, those who are praying, sighing between the between the porch and the altar, those who have gathered and become a holy convocation, those who are praying, God is going to do what? God is going to not, he's not going to despise their prayer. The prayer of the righteous availeth much. The prayer of those who experience righteousness by faith availeth much. He will not despise their prayer. They shall, this shall be written for the generations to come. You know why this was written? This was written for you and for me, this generation to come. This was written for you and for me to be convinced that now is the time for us to be praying for the latter rain. The result of the latter rain is unity. The result of the latter rain is love. Oh, this shall be written for this generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. To hear the groaning of the prisoners, to loose that which that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and praise and his praise in Jerusalem. God is going to get this work done with this generation. God is going to enlighten this generation. God is going to pour out his spirit, his latter rain on this generation of restoration. I pray that you have been convinced that you continue to be convinced by the fact that it's this generation that God is going to get this done with. It is this generation. I must read this last thing, this last thing, and then we will close this last point right over here. This last thing right over here in Isaiah chapter 41, reading from verse four, the Bible says, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generation from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he, the isle, saw it and feared the ends of the earth, were afraid to draw near and come. They helped everyone, his neighbor, neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. We are to encourage one another, pray together, unite together, study God's word together. That is what is to go on in this last generation. Not the infighting and all that foolishness, but unity upon the truth. Verse seven, so the carpenter encourages the goldsmith and the... And the and and that's he that smoothest with the hammer, him that smoteth the anvil, saying it is ready for the soldering, and he fastened it with his nails, that it should be not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee. And not cast thee away. Fear thou not, fear thou not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. They I will, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shalt not find them. Even them that contend with thee, they shall, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, said the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thrust the mountain and beat them and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. God is going to live out the perfect version of your life through you. He's going to help you. He's going to strengthen you. He will uphold you. He will give you the courage that you need to be able to face any kind of adversity in this last generation. The devil knows that in this generation, the latter rain is going to fall. The devil knows that this last generation is the one to vindicate the character of God. The devil knows that this is the generation of restoration, according to Joel's prophetic guide in chapter one and chapter two. It is my prayer that we choose to be restored by God. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? If not with us, then with who are you going to unite? 
With who are you going to be of good courage? Who are you going to encourage? Let us encourage one another. Let us pray in this generation for the latter rain. God will not despise our prayers. He will answer our prayers and God will restore this generation. In our next study, we're going to do a review of the 10 virgins. And this is a review that you do not want to miss because it will prepare us for the following study where we will learn a bit more and rather get closer to understanding the time of our visitation for us to experience full restoration. I do not want you to miss that study, but I also need for you not to miss our next study because that will prepare us for the following one. Next week, we're going to be studying Matthew chapter 25. So even review it yourselves, the parable of the 10 virgins. And that will prepare us to understand the time of our visitation so that we can experience the restoration as we are this generation that Jesus spoke of that will not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and for your truth. God, we've seen some things that right now we cannot unsee. And we ask that you may bring greater clarity to these things. We see that in the book of Joel, it gives us a prophetic guide showing us the generations of degradation and what they have done and how you said that you would restore that which was lost by the prior generations, how you would give this generation the latter reign. You said that you will give to us, that is this generation, what the previous generation had lost. God, we're just taking you at your word. And we would believe what you said and what you have promised to us. We're grateful that your Psalms under inspiration that says that you will listen to the prayer of the destitute. Many of us are destitute of love, of true friendship, kindness, of family, of things that we so desperately desire, God. We ask in Jesus' name, God, that you would restore our homes, that you would restore our minds and our hearts, that you would heal us of physical and spiritual sickness and disease. In the same way that you wanted to heal the prior generation of Laodicean lukewarmness, you want to heal us. Heal this generation. Pour out upon us your reign, the former and the latter reign, O God, that we may fulfill our purpose in this last generation. Thank you for loving us, Father. Forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Saints, it is my prayer that you have been richly blessed by the grace of God. We're going to continue to take our time and review these studies. Oh, the way that God has been leading is so interesting to me. So continue to pray for me as I pray for you. And as we study these things together, we're not going to run. I sometimes am tempted to run and just assume, okay, they get this. Let's move on to the next thing. No, we want to take our time and go step by step. I don't want you to miss anything that we're discovering and uncovering in the word of God. So do feel free to send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. If you have any questions, if there are any areas where I should bring clarity, please let me know via email because I want to be sure that we are all getting this truth together. If there's anything that has been said in the wrong way or misspoken or whatnot, send an email. Let us know. Iron sharpens iron. We want to more perfectly understand and study the word of God together because we're going to share this near, far, and wide. We want to be able to share the truth. And so I'm counting on the Holy Spirit, and I'm also counting on the Holy Spirit to work through you to share with me what it is that you're seeing so that I can also see and share with the world. And this is our work that we are doing together. So let's continue to study together, pray together, and uplift one another in prayer. So again, you can send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. If you'd like to invite us to speak at your church or with your group or whatnot, you can always send us an email as well. And we are always grateful for any opportunity to be able to share the word of God as he leads. We always bring it to the word, to, to God in prayer before we go anywhere. But we know that this gospel needs to go everywhere. So if you'd like to support the ministry, you can always do that. 
the links are provided below PayPal, Cash App, or Zelle Pay. Our email for that is lastrayministries at gmail.com. You could always do that. We're always grateful for anything that you give to help us push this gospel further and further and further, more consistently, effectively, and efficiently as well. Well, saints, I better let you guys go so you can have a wonderful evening as you may all be going to church tomorrow. I pray that you are richly blessed and that you have a happy, wonderful rest of your Sabbath experience. God bless you all.